Good evening. And welcome to Montana State University Provost Distinguished Lecturer. My name is Bob Makwa. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs at Montana State University. And it's, it's a genuine pleasure to well welcome you here tonight. You know, I know there's many other things you could be doing, and, and I want you to know how much we appreciate you coming tonight to, to listen to a very interesting speaker and to be able to spend some time together. So thank you, it's greatly appreciated. Tonight we're gonna to hear from uh, Dr. Dorlin Rossman, whose talk is Library and Information Science Today, Meeting Researchers at Their Point of Need. And I'm curious before we get started, if you wouldn't mind raising your hand, how many folks are here who, who work at, at MSU Library? If you could just raise your hand. Wow, very good. Let's all give everyone at the library a round. <laughs> the MSU Library is a fantastic place. You, you've all probably seen and observed this transition that's occurring in libraries you know, across the country, across the world. They're, they're no longer just a, a repository that store lots and lots of books. They, they do so much more. And when I think about our university, Montana State University, we're very fortunate to have a, a library group who, who are really at the cutting edge. And tonight we're gonna to hear some about in, in, in informatics and, and, and library information technology. But that's, that's the future. And when I think about our university, uh, just recently redesignated or, or, or uh, achieving the R1 designation again, for very high research capacity. That would not be possible without the MSU library and those folks here that, that work in the library and provide those incredibly valuable resources to, to the researchers, but also the, the, the educational component and the training uh, and, 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 and learning how, how, to, how to, to do research in, in a digital world. So thank you all so much for uh, for all that you do, for our university and for the community. If this is your first time attending one of these provost lectures, I'll, I'll, I'll warn you, this isn't your, your typical academic lecture. We'll, we'll certainly enjoy hearing about some, some important accomplishments from our speaker tonight, but also intertwined with that, it's an opportunity to hear more about, about their journey, their pathway what well, really brought them to this point in their career to be recognized as, as, a, as a world class scholar in their field. So it's, it's, it's a real treat. I, I learn something every time and, and that's why I, one of the reasons I enjoy these so much. Before we get started, I, I would like to introduce a, a few individuals here. Uh, there are a couple deans. Dean Roy Smith is, is in the back with his is his guest, Bonnie Smith, and we really thank you for joining. Uh, Royce is the Dean of, of our College of Arts and Architecture, and of course, Dean Kenny Arlich. Uh, I'm glad you wandered in tonight, Kenny. <laughs> Kenny is the Dean of our, our library. We have three Vice Provosts here, Dorwood Sovic, Steve Swinford, and Karina Beck. Thank, thank you all for, for coming as well. All right, without any further ado, my real job here, that, and I get to sit, stand on this really nice rug. I don't know where this came from, but it's very nice. But my real job here tonight, next to welcoming you and thanking you for coming, is to introduce our introducer. And so it's my pleasure tonight to introduce Dr. Kenny Arledge. Kenny has been the Dean of, of the Library at Montana State University since 2012. He holds a PhD in Library and Information Science from Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. And his funded research has focused on search engine optimization, as well as measuring impact and use of digital repositories. His research team developed the Repository Analytics and Metrics Portal, RAMP, which aggregates performance and uses data from institutional repositories. His, dis his dissertation on semantic web identity demonstrated that research libraries, academic units, and research centers are poorly understood by search engines. 
And this could result in a variety of unexpected consequences, especially with the ever-increasing reliance placed on internet search engines as a primary source of information. So it's reassuring to know that our library at MSU is leading the way in, the, in this growing field of information science. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenning Art, Dean of the Library. It's my great pleasure to introduce Doralyn Rossman, professor, librarian, <clears throat> and head of digital library initiatives at the Montana State University Library. Many thanks to Provost Makwa for selecting Doralyn for this distinguished lecture. I believe she is the first librarian to receive this honor. I have worked with Doralyn since 2012, and I feel fortunate to do so. She's always interested, always innovative, always dedicated, and she's greatly admired by her colleagues at MSU and across the state. Doralyn has had a rich and varied career in libraries, and I hope that one of the points you take from her presentation tonight is that the practice of library and information science is interdisciplinary by nature. Of course, our tradition and focus are to organize and manage the information that produces knowledge in our society, but we do that for and with all disciplines. Much of what we do is not readily visible, and as Doralyn will tell you tonight, it's only when things go wrong that our work becomes apparent, sometimes. But it's because of dedicated staff and faculty like Doralyn that things rarely go wrong, and why the MSU library has such a terrific reputation on campus. Doralyn, the stage is yours. So thank you all for coming tonight. I see a lot of familiar faces and a few not familiar faces, so that's great, because that means some of you are here hopefully to support me and the library's efforts, and hopefully some of you are here to learn some things that are brand new to you. So to start with, let's see. Um, I am what I would consider to be a modern academic librarian. And part of what that includes um, is being a member of the faculty. So I am a full professor at the MSU library, and I do things that typical faculty do, which includes teaching, and I teach credited courses, but I also support the teaching efforts at MSU, and that's through a lot of the infrastructure and services that we provide. So um, as Kenning observed, there's an interdisciplinary nature uh, to what we do at the library, and so there's a lot of different forms of teaching that go on. I also conduct research, which I'll be talking about later in the talk, and then I provide service that takes advantage of my expertise to best serve the MSU campus and community. And then, ultimately, these are integrated. When you submit your uh, promotion materials, you have to talk about integration. I found that one of the easiest things to do when I submitted my portfolio because that's naturally a part of my work. So my talk is going to take three um, parts. Initially, I'm gonna talk about how I got to be a librarian and then the work of what I do as a librarian and then the research I conduct um, that hopefully informs the work that I do. So, this is my family slide. Um, so on the left are my paternal grandparents, and um, my grandmother was working in a library at Rice University when my grandfather came in to do some research. So they met in a library. Um, then they had a daughter in the middle. Um, that's my aunt, her name is Dora Lynn, um, and I was named for her, and uh, she became a librarian. She had a very prominent career. Um, one highlight included serving as dean of the library at the university, library school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. 
So uh, she had more accolades than I do by far, so we won't go on and on and her about her anymore. Um, so, and then next is my, uh, me at a baseball game with my parents. Uh, we are at a Boston Red Sox spring training game. So um, my father is also a librarian. Um, he was a Presbyterian minister and stepped away from that, and my aunt suggested he might consider library science. He got a position at Duke University and ended up going to library school at UNC Chapel Hill. And my mother um, actually worked at Brodart, which is a company that supplies materials to libraries. And on the phone the other night, she mentioned that when she was a little girl, she used to play librarian with her dolls. And her parents even brought her a checkout stamp so she could check out her little golden books to her dolls. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then, of course, just to keep the tradition going, I married a librarian who I met at Rice University back where my grandparents first met. So, I think genetically programmed is probably a good way to describe why I'm a librarian. Um, so, I was born in Irving, Texas, and my parents moved to North Carolina when I was very young, and I grew up in Greensboro, North Carolina. And my Aunt Doralyn, being a librarian, was very interested in all things emerging, including uh, technologies. And so she had a computer, and she would send me to computer camps when I'd go visit her in the summertime. Um, and one of my first computers was a Texas Instruments computer. It looked very similar to this, but this is fancier because it has three colors on the screen. Mine only had green. So um, that's a fancier screen than I had. Um, I also had an Atari 400, which was a very early gaming system that had a keyboard with it, and I learned my uh, state capitals thanks to that computer. So um, my first experience in employment in a library, whoo, lights just got brighter on me, um, was my father got a job at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina when he graduated from library school. And he was the associate director and head of the Friends Historical Collection, which is a Quaker collection at Guilford. Um, my school was very near Guilford College, so after school I would go to the library and my dad would pay me a few dollars out of pocket to go shelve the books. So um, I was already employed at a very early age. Um, I will say my favorite part of working in that library was um, riding in a dumb elevator, a dumb waiter elevator with a little window that was not meant for me, it was meant for books. But I was sneaking in the elevator, and he didn't know that until the other day, and I told him, and he was, he was shocked. Um, so then I went to college at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and um, as my parents recollected, I called them one day and said that I was studying in the library, and I just felt this urge to find out if they had any jobs available, and um, they did, and so I got a job in the Reference and Government Documents Department at UNC Chapel Hill, and this is Davis Library where that was housed. Um, and then I was planning to go to law school and started talking to some friends who were older than I was and had gone to law school before me, and I just realized that wasn't what I had in mind from what they described. And so my father suggested I consider library school, and you can imagine I had mixed feelings about that. Feels like it's a little genetically programmed, um, but it also felt very um, familiar and exciting to me. So I decided to apply to UNC Chapel Hill's library school, got in, and decided I wanted to form a path that was my own, that was different than um, those of my other family members. So I tried to take courses and focus in areas that were um, things that I could call my own. And I was also a graduate assistant for Dr. Helen Thibault, and this involved working with um, data set management. So this was a really great introduction to me to working with large data sets, um, working with computers, cleaning up that information, um, and that's, those skills have continued with me throughout my career. Um, also, when I was in library school, I worked at St. Mary's College in Raleigh, North, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, Marty Smith here was one of my library science professors, and she hired me to work at that library. Um, that library was for the last two years of high school and the first two years of college for women. So it was a very unusual um, mix of ages. And it was a great job. It was a small library. She had me doing collection development, like picking books, using reviews from various um, library publications. Uh, I would worked on their online catalog system. I worked on shelving books. I worked on checking out books. It was the whole gamut. And it was a really, really great experience, and Marty was a great mentor to me. 
so my first job out of library school was at the University of Illinois at Chicago. So I went there in a residency program and they encourage you to come there for a year and if all was going well, they'd offer you a second year. And then beyond that, they were fine if you left because you were a resident. Um, they were also encouraged to apply for tenure track lines there. So, let's get some water. Um, my first year I was hired in as a reference and government documents librarian. Fast found out that my technology skills were noticed, and so I was invited to be um, in the systems department in my second year. And one of the big projects we did while we were there was to implement the first web-based online catalog for our library. And there weren't web-based catalogs for most libraries. A lot of libraries had like telnet-based catalogs, but this was the first one that was a web-based one that was had a nice user interface. And we worked with Ameritech Systems and developed that catalog and that was a really big project um, for us and it was great experience. Uh, person pictured here is Joan Fisella. I had an opportunity to write a book chapter and I had not done so before. So I approached her and asked her if she would co-author. And she was very hesitant at first. She said that she had had varying experiences with resident librarians <laughs> and so I assured her I would not let her down. And we had a great collaboration and she remains a mentor for me still today. So, as you can see, there's a lot of themes here. Um, there was a position that opened up at Rice University when I was at the end of my two years at UIC, and I decided I wanted an opportunity to be able to work at a place where I'd spent much of my childhood growing up visiting my grandparents in Houston. My father had gone to school at Rice, as I had my aunt, as I mentioned, my grandparents met there. So I applied for a job that was in reference and government documents. I got there and they said, you know, we have this grant, and in this grant, we need somebody with technology skills to be part of an interdisciplinary team. Would you be interested in being a multimedia projects and data librarian in our Center for Technology and Teaching and Learning instead? <laughs> so I said, sure. Um, and so that was really, it was kind of an instructional technology kind of position. It was helping people integrate their technologies into their classrooms using information resources from the library in particular. Um, we had a really fancy classroom that we worked a lot in. The, the classroom today wouldn't look fancy, but it was somewhat similar to the teal classrooms you see at MSU. So that was pretty cutting edge in 1996 um, that they were doing that. Um, at the end of that grant cycle, I also had the opportunity to step into a newly formed role. We had had a donation from a prominent politician in um, Texas to start a GIS data center in the library. And what we were seeing is geographic information systems or GIS software was in pockets across campus and it created some territoriality. Suddenly, you know, if I am a psychologist and I go into the earth sciences department or scientists may make you feel a little bit like you don't belong there. Likewise, if an earth scientist went to a psychologist's um, space and did the same thing, it just doesn't feel like it's mutually owned. And what was great about forming the center is the library really belongs to everybody. And so this was an opportunity to centralize some services and make them available to everybody. And then we would see like collisions in there of awesome collisions. Like I had a sociologist and a historian in there one time, they started talking to each other about their research and ended up being um, co-researchers after that because they were in the same space. Um, and here I am pictured with a plotter we had just gotten and I was super excited about it because it was really fancy technology for the time. Um, also in the late 90s, there was an article in the American Libraries magazine, which is the um, leading magazine in the American Library Association, the largest professional association of the library science profession. And there was an article about, about 20 people in their 20s who are emerging leaders. And I was featured in that article and they were asked us to give them a quote. And then the quote I have here, which I think is funny, because I think it's right, <laughs> um, is that there will be more people with more access points to information. So this is my prediction of the future, and I do think more people have more access points to information. So, phew, good thing. <laughs> um, so from there, um, I went to the University of Wyoming, and I was head of systems there and an assistant professor. 
And I, doing research for this, art, this talk today, came across this newsletter that I wrote talking about us installing wireless technologies in the library. And in this article, I talk about how you can use the internet on your phone. Ooh. <laughs> so that, at the time, seemed pretty cutting edge. Now we just take that for granted. Um, and so I was only at Wyoming for a year because um, I got engaged, and I, so I had an opportunity to either come to Bozeman or have my fiancé come to Wyoming, and a position opened up at Bozeman first, and I applied for it, and I got it. So, and most people did not know we were engaged, so got it all in my own credentials. So um, in 2001, I came to MSU, and I was hired in as a staff member, a professional staff, as a library systems analyst. And um, that was basically supporting the technology um, at MSU library and for academic libraries across Montana. So we maintained um, the integrated library system for a number of libraries. And so that work was pretty detailed and working with partners across the state. I was then promoted to assistant director for library systems and then decided to pursue a master's of public administration. So I was in that program and graduated in 2008. And you'll see here me pictured with uh, Dr. Eric Austin and Dr. Liz Shanahan. And Liz is actually here in the audience and uh, remains a good friend and colleague. And um, that was just a really great experience. Um, so when I graduated in 2008, a position came open in the faculty at MSU Library. And as you can imagine, having been faculty at other institutions, I was eager to get back into that kind of role. So I uh, applied and got to be head of collection development which meant that I was in charge of overseeing the information resources provided by the MSU library. I started as an assistant professor and was promoted to associate professor. And then in 2017, I took a sabbatical. So I was um, on my sabbatical fall 2017, spring of 2018. And in that time, we had some organizational shifting and I had an opportunity to step back into the role I like the most, which is leading a technology unit in this case, the head of digital library initiatives. And then I also put in my dossier for promotion to full professor, which was awarded in 2021. So that's my MSU path. So you might wonder what digital library initiatives are. So I thought I'd give you a few examples of some of the technologies my department supports. So hopefully some of you have heard of our Ivan Doig archive. This is perhaps our most fully developed digital collection. Uh, we acquired Ivan Doig's materials from his widow, um, Carol Doig, and part of that agreement was to fully digitize that collection. So uh, that was a really big undertaking and it's really paid off um, in so many ways. And we continue to add to that collection based on Carol's um, generous donations. Uh, so in this case, we have books, note cards, um, manuscripts, photographs, all sorts of different kinds of materials. So my department would provide some of the programming for that, the application development, the database backend, um, all the things that make this work technologically. Another example of a digital collection is our Acoustic Atlas database. This has sounds from Montana and the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which includes habitats and various species from out, throughout the United States. So these are audio collections that are available for anyone to use. These are really great for integrating into the classroom. Um, we have a variety of different recordists who contribute to this, and we've had a special arrangement with Yellowstone National Park to capture many of the sounds from there. So you can also imagine with a sound database, there are different challenges that go with that technologically, trying to make sure that um, it's, the things are well described. We've taken those sounds and modified them so you can get ringtones and use them in a variety of really fun ways. Another example of our digital work is the ScholarWorks Institutional Repository. And so this is where you find a number of MSU authored publications. You find all of MSU's theses and dissertations in here, um, any works that MSU authors have contributed. So this is a really great place if you're trying to recruit students and they wanna see what's coming out of MSU, if faculty members maybe want to make their things more easily findable and accessible, you may normally have your information behind some kind of paywall, but you can deposit a version of your article in here depending on the rights with that particular publisher. So maintaining this is 
a great preservation piece for MSU, but it's also a great um, face um, space for you to actually see what's coming out of the university. And along with this, we obviously have a lot of conversations with people about their um, rights and copyright and um, what they're actually allowed to do with the works that they've published. And then finally, a technology we have physically in the library is our virtual discovery space. Um, this is a virtual reality space where people can come and try out virtual reality technologies. It's been a great supplement to classrooms where somebody might want to have their students use virtual reality in addition to what's happening in the classroom. Um, I received a grant where I've got also um, some headsets that can be used in classrooms that aren't wired in like some of these are. And we focus on educational technologies and then I've connected with other virtual reality providers on campus and we have a really good network we, where we direct people depending on whether they're needing to make virtual reality apps or use the technologies. And again, this reminds me of that GIS data center I mentioned at Rice, because we're centrally located, anybody from MSU can use this, and it's a really great way of breaking down barriers where somebody might be intimidated, perhaps, to enter somebody else's space. So the DLI department has 14 faculty and staff, some of whom are here tonight, thank you for coming. Um, and that includes various areas, including system administration, so server maintenance, uh, desktop support for things like the virtual reality space I mentioned and our other technologies in the building, um, application development and digital projects, so we saw some of the digital projects here. Scholarly communication would include that scholar works that I mentioned, as well as uh, copyright, author funds, I mean author rights, um, our newest group is the Rhodes Group, which is the Research Optimization Analytics and Data Services Group. So they are working with people and their data, helping research become as visible as possible, um, and then doing some analyzing of the work to make sure that actually the things that we're doing are actually getting um, some results. And then one of my own personal interests is around virtual and augmented realities. And as I mentioned before, I do teaching research and service around many of these areas. So my job helps inform um, that part of my work. All right, let's get on to the research. Uh, so I describe my research as practitioner research. So this is different than some other kinds of research in that the work that I do, I feel like completely informs the, the research informs my work, my work informs my research, Service works its way in there too. So this can help me sometimes solve a problem. In the case of the virtual discovery space, it was a space that was not working well in the way it had been set up initially and so did some work to try to figure out what's the best way to have this space configured to actually have it be used in the ways that users feel comfortable. Um, as Kenning mentioned, we contribute to the learning of all disciplines. So trying to figure out how that happens and the best way to connect with different disciplines. We add value to the information life cycle, all different elements from the time information is born to when it's being uh, cultivated, to when it's published, to when it's archived, um, to when it's perhaps at the end of the life cycle. Uh, you can influence policy. That policy could be around ethics policies, privacy policies, and then ultimately practitioner research is put into practice. It's not just doing the research, perhaps to answer a question, but it's trying to figure out how to better do our work or help others do their work better. So um, I mentioned the virtual discovery space. Um, in this case, um, did some research on evidence-based practice for virtual reality spaces and services. So my um, co-author, Scott, who's up here, um, he and I worked on that and helped revamp the space and then shared that experience. A newer project I've done is using augmented reality to make a library tour, and we'll see if my toggle works here. Um, so, this is, I, uh, hang on. Okay, so this is, I took some 360 images with my phone and uploaded those to Google Street View and created images of the library out front and then some images in the building. And you can see these little circles that are kind of glowing. Those are the augmented reality where I've added some information that people can click on. So for example, if they click on this bicycle, 
It will tell you about bicycle parking information, and then this link here takes them to a web page about bicycle parking information. And in this case, I took a picture of what this plaque is, and now you can actually read it because I put a picture in there. And then from here, I can also go inside the library. And this software that allows me to do this is called ThingLink, um, and they specifically support ideas like doing virtual tours. And so this is a fun concept of how you can use technologies to enhance the library, and further applications that have come to me are perhaps doing something in the archives where you could have somebody tour the archives without ever having to leave the comfort of their chair. And it's a really great way to interact with the items without having to touch them and make an appointment, and it might intrigue you enough that you actually do make the appointment from there. So if you want to take a tour of the library, this is linked from the MSU Library's website, and you can go from the basement up to the fourth floor and see things that you've never noticed before. Especially the artwork, apparently, according to the feedback I've gotten. Um, another area of my research is public budgeting, and so my master's in public administration um, professional paper focused on looking at the democratic values that were present in the University Planning Budget Advisory Committee, which was in place at the time. So that was a combination of what's now sort of planning council and budget council. And the president at that time, Jeff Gamble, had told the committee they should be open to and inclusive, the, open to and inclusive of the entire campus community. And so I was curious how this 24-member committee of vice presidents, deans, um, shared governance representatives from faculty senate, staff senate, student council, how they interpreted that um, charge. And so it was really interesting. I interviewed all 24 members of that group um, and ended up writing that and getting it published in a prominent public administration journal. Um, so from there, that stuck with me, and so when I stepped into the collection development role I mentioned, I was managing a budget of over $5 million for our information resources, and I felt like there was a not a great awareness of what the library did with that money, even though, and I think one of the reasons is, like Kenning said, about the transparency issue. We provide things really seamlessly, and when things break, that's when you notice. And so we provide access to thousands of journals, um, many of which are very expensive. And so I wanted to change the perception of this by putting an idea out there about how we talked about our budget. So the way our budget was constructed, it was around items. So on the left, you'll see those are things. And those don't really tell a story. I mean, what's the story behind that? It doesn't say how people are using it. So I was interested in more about the story. And so there are elements of these things on the left, on the things on the right, but there's a lot more that we do. So we do surfacing and discovery. We don't want to buy things or subscribe to things if you can't find them. So we make efforts to go out on the web and make them well indexed, well understood, findable by search engines, um, easily browsed if you go to our website, tools on our website to help you do that browsing. Uh, we also provide the access to that information, and that means we make it so you can get to it off campus, you can get it to it from your apartment, from um, across the, to the other side of the world, you can get access to that information. Um, we create things, so I already showed you examples of things we're making from scratch. So we're not just getting information from elsewhere, we're adding information to the body of knowledge out there. And then, ultimately, yes, we do acquire some things. <laughs> so I, I felt like that, um, that libraries don't do themselves a service when they're just talking about those line items. <laughs> you need to tell the story behind it. And so um, we, Kenning and I, co-authored that article in the hopes that other libraries would start thinking about how we talk about ourselves external to the library. So next, open educational resources and Creative Commons licensing. And these both encourage information sharing and reuse. So my mm -hmm. colleague, Christina Tronell, um, put together some of the information on these slides. And basically, libraries are part of an ecosystem that has some things what I consider to be broken. Um, in this case, textbook costs have increased 1,000% since the 1970s. I consider that to be a broken model. Um, so what libraries have done is tried to figure out ways they can help 
correct that problem. So we initially conducted a survey of students at MSU, and in the results of that, 58% of them reported that they did not purchase the required textbook due to the cost. And consequently, they reported that they also sometimes received a poor or failing grade, dropped or withdrew from a course, took fewer courses, or perhaps skipped a required course when they could have taken it because they couldn't afford the textbook. So um, during my sabbatical, I took a certification program out of the University of Minnesota um, that talked about open educational resources, specifically aimed at librarians. And part of what we learned about in open educational resources, or OER, um, is that those are basically the concept of open textbooks. And so what is being encouraged is that people make textbooks that are affordable, freely available, reasonable, resharable. And so there are five, they could talk about the five R's. So ultimately, again, you can reuse it. So if somebody makes an OER, they put it out there. You can use it, you can use it again, you can modify it, um, you can revise it. So that's the next R there. Um, so if you find an OER you like, you can modify it for your class so it doesn't have to be this cookie cutter whatever the publisher came up with. You can remix it, you like a chapter here and you like a chapter here, you can put that together and make a new OER. The uh, spirit behind this is that you will not just make your OERs in isolation, you'll redistribute it. So hopefully you will put it out there and say to others, I made this, feel free to take it and do what you want to with it for your class. And then ultimately students retain access. So there are some models where students may pay for access to a book for a semester and then when they're done with the class, the access goes away. In this case, they retain access to that thing forever. So you're not just buying access to the information, you're buying permanent access to the information. In this case, you're not even buying it, you're just getting it with the class. So as a result of that certificate program, um, we started a open educational resources grant program. And through that grant program, um, we have helped 33 faculty adopt OER for their classes. 17 faculty have created their own OER, and that may be modifying somebody else's, writing it from scratch, um, all sorts of variety in there. And then from 2019 to 2021, we estimate that we have saved 9,600 students over $1.125 million. So, woo, yay! <laughs> um, and I, the, that program, the investment has been $50,000 a year. So that's $50,000 a year over three years has saved $1,125,000 totally worth it. And the reason we have a grant is because it takes time to adapt a talk textbook. We recognize faculty members, um, if they're doing that, is not something they can just do like that. So it does take some time and sometimes they need incentives. Um, we also established the MSU Excellence in, Open, in Education Award. I learned about that through my um, certification program that another school had done that, so we set this up and the MSU library sponsors the award and we've funded three of them and Kendra Campbell is our most recent winner, which was she was just announced a few days ago. So this is another way to recognize the value of this and um, help people feel more incentivized by publicly recognizing them. Uh, I also mentioned the sort of Creative Commons certification. Uh, so Creative Commons is a licensing on top of copyright. So when you make something, copyright auto automatically applies. But copyright is very restrictive and very long lasting. What Creative Commons certification does is allow you to say, I can let you use this in a more liberal way. And there are six different licenses which are down at the bottom there. But basically they say, so the BY is by, so if you have that kind of license that says you can use this, you just need to attribute the person who made it, the person it's by. So give me a link, give me the title, who made it, and from there you can go ahead and use it. And then there are more restrictive versions where people can say you can use it but not for commercial purposes, or if you use it you must share it out like I shared mine out in the first place, or no derivatives or like no making new things. So when we do the OER work we do, we apply a Creative Commons license with that, and we do that for other MSU authored things where people will come to us and say, how can I make my thing more shareable? 
So an example of the derivative works I mentioned um, is something I made for my class. These are from the Noun Project, which has little um, icons you can use, and you can pay a little bit of money to use things without having to make any attribution, or you can pay, use them for free as long as you provide attribution. So in this case, I paid so I didn't have to attribute. Um, and so a derivative work is taking one, two or more things and making something new. So the first one up there is a dog and a donut, or as I called it, a phi donut. <laughs> um, I also took an elephant and I chopped off its head and I put an owl on there and I made an owl elephant. And then finally, um, I took a giraffe and a cat and I made a carafe. So this is encouraging you to be creative. Um, so those were two certifications I got that I felt could really help the MSU community, and some of my other library colleagues have had similar certifications, and so we worked together as a team. Um, the next area of my research is focused on social media. Um, my colleague Scott and I co-authored two books. Um, the first one focused more on the social media community building angle, and the second one focuses more on social media optimization. So I'll talk more about those. Um, as I mentioned, my work is informed by my research, and so I teach a class called Social Media Practices. This is LSCI 437. And in that class, we do explore many of the things we explore in those two books that um, we wrote. So initially, we talk about social media as an individual, and that's probably how most of us are familiar with being in social media as ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to do social media as an organization, that's a very different thing. Um, in this class, the students all create a social media plan for an organization, so that's something we make throughout the semester. It gives them something they can show future employers that they've made, and it helps them think about how do you form an organizational voice on a social media platform. So from there, we talk about how you actually build community with, um, as an organization through social media. We look at some of the algorithms that are used in those networks and try to understand how information is presented to users and how the algorithms affect that. We examine um, ethics practices in the class. So what do we do with the fact we're in those spaces? We have access to a lot of data. Um, we have users who are interacting with us. What are some of the ethical considerations? What are the best practices to be in those spaces? And given all the things we know about social media, because we know social media has a lot of problems, but people still use it, how do we be in those spaces in a way that it aligns with library ethics and our own personal and professional ethics? And um, those are some hard questions. And I will say, the first time I taught this class, um, it was the election um, when uh, President Trump was elected in the middle of that semester. So we had a lot of information to work with that we learned about social networks in that particular go round. Um, at the time when I was working on some of this research, I was maintaining the Twitter account for the library. And so an, an example of trying to make an organization feel accessible is giving the feeling there is actually a human being behind that account. So um, I had an idea to create a mascot for the library. And so I purchased this bobcat from the bookstore and we had a naming contest and uh, somebody suggested Rufus, the Scientific name for the uh, bobcat is Rufus Lynx, so Rufus seemed like a good name, and uh, I knitted him a little scarf and everything. <laughs> um, and then these are his bob kitten nephews that I also um, acquired, and so here he is giving them a tour of campus, and now they're in the library. And so Rufus shows up still today in some of our various things, but it makes things a lot more fun. I mean, if you're just taking a picture for example, of a photocopier, it's a lot more fun if Rufus is in the picture. So, um, so we, and we'll see here, there was a, a comment, five retweets, and 24 likes, which for an organizational account, especially a library, that's actually pretty good. So that was a really fun way to see sort of like the before and after once we started adding these humorous elements. And um, it's really fun to be creative like this. That was, I mean, a lot of fun. Um, the social media optimization piece um, is adding code to web pages that allows you to control how social networks display your information. So you'll see here on the left is a tweet from one of our digital collections that does not have any markup on it. So it just shows the URL and whatever you wrote. The one on the right is a different digital collection where we've actually applied the tagging and it 
takes what you've written, but then it populates the rest of it for you. So it pulls that MSU library and our logo, it pulls a photo, it pulls a title, and it pulls a description. So I would venture to guess that most of you will probably find this to be a little bit more interesting tweet than the one on the left. So if you don't provide this information, sometimes search engines will guess, and sometimes they just won't do anything. So you can control how those social networks display your data if you take the time to add just a little bit of coding to your web pages. So for those of you who want to get a little geeky, I provided some code. Um, and you'll see here, you can see the words Twitter, and you can see where it says OG, that's for Facebook Open Graph. And so basically, just adding a few lines into that web page coding, you can tell it what image you want it to use, what description you want it to use, um, the location of those images. And so we did that for our digital collections and see now we see in our analytics a lot more social media traffic being driven to our site because we've taken a little more time to add some value to those pages. Um, some more recent work I've been doing with my colleague Jason here um, is on knowledge graphs and semantic web identity. And this is again working to get more information to the search engines out there, helping them understand what the library is because we know some people know the library, but do they always know to think of the library and what can we do to put information in their faces when they happen to be in search engine spaces? So this is our library webpage for services. So you can see we've got a lot of services that we offer, not just traditional ones you might think of, but more beyond that. So more code. Um, so what we did, for some of our knowledge graph project is we were trying to expand the idea of what is a library. We know it's a building, we know it has books. We also know, at least in the library, that it's a lot more than that. So in the services example, we have a lot of knowledge of things. And so we can say to it, hey, we offer uh, data management. And when we say data management, if you go to Wikidata, here's an article that defines or a brief description of what we mean by data management. Similarly, down below, when we say data services, we pulled a Wikipedia article to say, when we say data services, this is what it means. So it's a way to tell search engines more about what you're doing. And when we say this, this is what we mean. So you can give search engines a better understanding of what you're doing, and it's expanding it beyond, beyond what perhaps it might have thought based on other signals from the semantic web. So we applied this kind of work to our resources page as a starting point. Um, in 2015, the page views on the resources pages were 7,807, and as of 2021, we're up to 25,000. So we've seen a huge uptick in page views. So that means more people are getting driven to us by search engines. Um, we did this through, and this is getting into the weeds, so you don't have to remember this. <laughs> um, we used schema.org vocabulary. We also added the Facebook open graph tagging and Twitter card tagging for social media optimization. And then we used vocabulary from DBpedia, Wikidata, and Wikipedia. So as part of this work, um, Jason and I, just at the end of 2021, ended up applying a lot more of this coding to other pages to see what else we can do beyond what we've already done with the resources page. And the knowledge graph I mentioned is trying to get search engines to understand a broader meaning of the library. So in this case, the library is in the center and we provide spaces as we know, but we also provide services, we provide resources, we provide people. And these all have a relationship to each other. And we want search engines to better understand that relationship. So we've gone through and identified some of the key points on our website that we can add markup to, to create more understanding for search engines. So we're already seeing some very early preliminary results um, that look promising. And we're actually presenting that information um, at the NISO conference next week. And we've partnered with the London School of Economics because they're doing similar work with Wikidata. So that's a really exciting emerging area. Uh, this is not research related. Um, so I had an opportunity in 2007, President Gamble 
sent me to the Higher Education Resources Services Institute at Bryn Mawr College, and I was there for three and a half weeks with other women in higher education leadership and had a really great experience. And I was so thankful to be invested in in that way. And my colleague, Jill Thorngren, who was also at that same institute, she and I came back to MSU saying, you know, we really wish we had something. We could send everybody to this, but you can't. It's expensive. Um, and it's a big investment. So we came back, and um, Paula Lutz was also new to MSU at that time. She was the dean of the College of Letters and Science. She came here, had Leadership Institute experience, and she was also saying to President Campbell, we need to have some local leadership. So he put the three of us together and told us to go around and shop our idea. So we did, um, and got support from it, and we got funding from the provost's office and the president's office and the vice president of research at that time's office, and started DEAL, the Developing Excellence in Academic Leadership. And that program is still going strong. It's now um, hosted in the Center for Faculty Excellence. And um, Allison Harmon is the current director. And this was meant to leverage local leadership, form cohorts amongst people um, across the institution, and give emerging leaders a chance to build their skills. So um, as of um, now, we've had 175 graduates of this program since we started it in 2009. So I'm very proud of that, and I still see a lot of the graduates here. So I hope that says that they felt a little more a part of MSU and a little more invested. Um, and this is a, one of the program cohorts, um, and so I thought that was, it, it does exactly what I want. You can just tell that that's a group that's really um, melded together. Um, and then finally, I went to the Leading Change Institute, which is a Educause CNI sponsored um, institute that involves libraries and information science leaders. And I went to that at the very end of my sabbatical in 2018, thanks to Kenning's support. So continue to be active in leadership development. So I hope one thing you might take away from my talk today is thinking more about today's academic library and librarian. Um, ultimately, while we do provide you with information, it's a wide variety of information, and we provide you with a wide variety of services that go along with that. So not just the information resources themselves, but how um, you can actually use your information better, make your research more visible, make your data management plan better. Um, so if, you, if it has to do with information, I can guarantee you the library can do something to help you with it. Uh, we are adapting to rapidly changing environments. I, if I think back to when I started in library school, it was right on the cutting edge of when library catalogs were taking up a large footprint in the lobbies of libraries. There were like two computer workstations next to those that were running a Telnet-based library catalog system. And um, then the job at Chicago, one of the reasons they thought I was good at technology is because I knew how to install the CD-ROMs on the standalone CD-ROM workstation, and that was the only one who could figure it out. So, um, and now we're in an environment where I'm getting to you know, play with virtual reality, and we're doing this programming on the web, and, and I think that's what a lot of libraries, um, all libraries are doing, is they're constantly looking at where people are where libraries should be in those spaces so that we are there when you need us and not just there, um, you know, sort of stuck in the dark ages. So I think we're one of the most rapidly adoptive of new technologies environments because that's where our users are. Um, we also lead the way. So we really do try to make access to information easier. And I'm really happy with the work that um, OER do, and then another area I didn't mention is open access. Um, open access is a way to make publications available to anyone freely by either just pu publishing in a journal that has no costs to access it, or by paying a fee to the publisher to make that open to anybody. So we are trying to reduce those barriers and make um, access more equitable. And then again, reducing barriers, we do try to make um, things as easy to get to as possible. So by getting into search engines, by um, providing access to you from off campus, all the different ways that we work are trying to make the user experience that much better. So I have a cute animal to show you. Um, the cute animal I'm gonna show you is 
something I saw on my sabbatical. This is at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, and this is an otter that they had there, and they take otters from the Monterey Bay, and these are ones who cannot be released back out into the wild because they've been injured, um, and then they do also rescue other otters that can be um, released back in the wild. They put them in here, and the older otters mentor them to be stronger, better otters. So um, I, if you ever have a chance to go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, I highly encourage you to do so. I, end up, I was there on a Saturday, planned to be there for two hours, and I think I spent the whole day there, <laughs> so mostly with the otters. Um, anyway, so if nothing else, you got to see an otter today. And then, let's see. Uh, well, okay, we're going to keep seeing this otter. Okay, there you go. Um, so I'm interested in continuing this conversation. We can do that here in the lobby, but you can also reach me over email, over Twitter. Um, I'm glad to talk with you over coffee. Um, but as you can tell, hopefully, I really like being a librarian. I enjoy talking about my work, and this has been a lot of fun being able to go down memory lane and, and uh, revisit all the different stops along the way. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. I, I, I'd like your opinion on how much, uh, how much the role of technology and the role of libraries in uh, combating misinformation. So you know, we talk about access to information, but of course we have access to misinformation. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a great question. One of the things we cover in my social media class is about information, misinformation, and disinformation. And so misinformation and disinformation. Um, and I actually got, get them confused, but disinformation, when it, it can be when somebody's intentionally putting bad information out there, and sometimes misinformation is information maybe somebody doesn't know is wrong, but they continue to share it. So a lot, I think a huge part of that is user education. So um, a lot of what we end up doing in our work, working with users and faculty across campus, is giving them ways to identify the quality of information. So for example, is if somebody's citing something, are they, is it clear where that information came from? Is it clear what that author was trying, who their audience was intended for? Is it published on a reputable website? Um, when they mention their, the things in there, do they actually cite sources or do they just state something as fact? Um, there is a project out of Clemson University that's called Spot the Troll. And if you go to Spot the Troll, you can go in and you can see profiles of various users and you're supposed to guess what's an actual real person and what's a troll. And I did this um, presentation at a conference uh, last year and we, people were getting them right about 50% of the time because it's so hard to tell. So there are clues out there. Um, so I think the biggest thing we do is user education. Um, another thing we try to do is only collect what we consider to be um, reputable information. And of course, as we know, I mean, it's only as good as how well the publisher is monitoring that. But um, we try to make sure that the information we acquire is from reputable pu publishers. And I think that's something libraries have done well for a long time. I think one of the biggest struggles we're dealing with now is how do we represent those underrepresented populations in libraries? So frequently libraries buy bestsellers, for example. What if it's a marginalized voice? Maybe it's not a publisher that has a lot of a big reputation because they haven't been prioritized by our society. So one thing that we're working harder on is raising some of those voices that have not traditionally made it into um, libraries or other mainstream publishing spaces. So I think that's, for me, I think one of the biggest areas where we are trying to catch up along with a lot of society in general. So is that? Yep. Somebody had a question, somebody else? Liz. Okay. Liz. Um. So, thank you very much for the trip down memory lane. Um, I, I uh, back in the old days, I used to watch the Horizon Report every year and see what they were predicting was going to happen. And I remember about 20 years ago, I used to say, "Wait, wait, 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 w
in some ways, but what are you today, what do you say, boy, I can't wait for this to happen or I can't wait for this something to catch up with us? Hmm. Um, well, I guess because I've spent some time with it, I'm really interested in virtual and augmented realities in particular. I think it's easier for us to provide access to those technologies in the library, but I think there's a lot of potential for libraries to be in those spaces. So I have experienced over the pandemic being in a virtual space and I'm an avatar and I'm at a conference and there are other avatars in there and I mean, talk about not knowing what somebody looks like. I mean, one one case, I was a talking piece of pizza. I mean, <laughs> nobody had any idea what I looked like as a talking piece of pizza, but people liked me, I'll tell you that. But, but, um, um, so I think there's a lot of potential for libraries to be in a virtual reality. reality spaces, particularly ones that are literally interactive, like other people are in there. So I can imagine if you were a student who's perhaps intimidated about going to the library and asking a question, well, suddenly they could, I don't know, be a hamburger and I could be a piece of pizza and they could come ask me a question. And to me, that, that reduces a lot of barriers there. So I feel like there is so much potential for how we could be in spaces like that um, that creates new dynamics of how we interact with each other um, and could take advantage of some learning opportunities there. So I think libraries have you know, dip their toe in the water with making access to those technologies, but I don't think we've done a lot of the developing in those areas, and I, that's an area where I think there's a lot of potential. So I don't think libraries are there yet. I did just see an ad, though, for uh, Rochester University. They had a space that was specifically dedicated to that idea, and they're hiring somebody, but I'm not moving to Rochester. <laughs> Great question, Richie, and I think you can take that to the bank given the accuracy of Doralyn's prediction back in the <laughs> But One more question, Liz, our vice, vice, associate vice president for research. <laughs> well, I have a faculty hat on right now with this question, and I hope you can hear me okay with this mask. Um, so firstly, Doralyn, you have this incredible breadth of experience that you have like, you know, knit these sinews across First, with humor, which I think is brilliant and has really benefited a lot of us as faculty and students, um, but also how you have woven technology across these different interests, from you know budgeting to you know icons, common um, whatever that was called. Um, the <laughs> no, no project. Yeah. So I'm interested. I'm going to do a bit of a dive into the um, open educational resources. So how, like, we are. Um, as faculty, very individually, instrumentally motivated, A, to get, you know, promoted, um, and, you know, with regard to books, like, you get the, you know, the huge kudos if you publish with Cambridge, and you don't with OER. So how, how can, firstly, how do you as a librarian, or the library writ large, talk to faculty about how this is so ethically the right thing to do, and it's really important, and then how do you talk to people, like, you know, Bob, right next to you, the provost, in terms of the RRTP, and how can we advance this beautiful idea, 50K a year, you know, over three years for over a million dollars of savings, plus that has been out there, and it continues to proliferate. It's, it's beautiful. And so how can we make that even more robust? Yeah, yeah. Really well. well, I could do a whole other talk to answer some of that, but, I, um, but those are great observations. And I would say that there, I can, think of a couple other parallels to that. Um, so if you think about um, impact factor and rankings of journals, that's been a traditional measure, right? And so another measure is called alt metrics, so alternate metrics. So alternate metrics look at how often something might have appeared in somebody who was interviewed, somebody who was appeared on radio, on in a newspaper, they were appeared on social media, they were written about in a blog post. Those have different kinds of indicators, but yet we tend to still focus on impact factor. Um, another one you mentioned was about publishing books and the value there. Um, I had a third one and it's not in my head anymore. Um, but I think part of the challenge here is we have to change that ecosystem. And that's, I mean, that ecosystem's been in place for a long time. So I think that means that we continue to have those conversations. And I think we look at our role in scope documents and every college's role in scope could start scoping out that we value open educational resources. We will count those the same as a book. 
Um, we will count something that's published in an open access journal um, the same as something that's behind a paywall. We will count a blog post that has a high number of interactions with it um, the same. And an example I have is that there was a researcher here who did an art, I mean, an interview on National Public Radio's Morning Edition, I heard, and it was around psychology research. And I thought, this person's not talking to psychologists. I mean, sure, some of them are listening, but this person was able to talk about their research in a way to speak to the anybody listening to the radio, and they had to speak about it in a way that anybody generally would understand. I would venture to guess that person reached a lot more people through that than a typical psychology journal that's peer reviewed. And so I, I think those kinds of conversations are immensely important, but I also think it's partly up to the uh, candidate who's going up for promotion to tell that story. And I know you appreciate storytelling and narrative um, that you have to be able to explain this is why this was important. But I think our role in scopes, frankly, in our annual review processes do need to recognize that. So um, I hopefully the more we have these conversations, the more people are aware and say that that's a priority. Yeah. That was a great question and a great place to end. And Liz, now you can put your vice president of research hat back on in our office because we can start working with the departments because I'm completely on board. Yeah. I think the OER, we're making great progress, but there's a lot more we can do. And I, I love to see those numbers go up by a factor of 10. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. let's work on that. All right, we're committed to it. Let's give Dora a little more round. I knew I would learn some things, Dora Lynn, but you also inspired me. It was a great talk, so thank you. So an appreciation for your, for your lecture tonight. We have a nice plaque you can hang on your wall. And uh, also this beautiful engraved crystal flame. And I like to think of it as being symbolic of the light of knowledge that you spread through your work. So thank you so much. Now before I close out our class for this evening, I think there's another gift folks have for you, Norlin. So we have several members of our Friends of the Library um, board here, and I just want to thank you. I think the fact you're even here means the world to me. The fact you brought flowers is even nicer. So thank you for your time and your volunteering and for the support of the library. So, and thank you all for coming. I'm like, I'm feeling emotional in a really good way. So thank you. <laughs> concludes our, our, our lecture for tonight. Uh, before we break, uh, I would like to extend a special thanks to, to Julie Hurd and Cami Wagner, the students working in my office, for pulling this together. And please also thank the, the students out in culinary services for, for the really nice refreshments that they've uh, put together for us to enjoy. So I look forward to joining you out in the, in the entryway to have some refreshments. Please follow up and ask Dorlin some more questions that you might have. And, and thank you for attending tonight. Take care.